a long, long time from now, astronomically speaking. Then we have Canis Major and Canis Minor, big dog, little dog, the hunting dogs that are following Orion the hunter around in the sky. Proce and it, it's kind of interesting that both Canis Major and Canis Minor, they have both have one very bright star, and it just so happens that with both of these that, that they're in a, a binary with a white dwarf companion. They have a companion star that already went through all of its evolutionary sequences and ended up with a stellar core of a white dwarf. Um, Procyon is a subgiant. It has transitioned off the main sequence, and uh, Sirius is still on the main sequence. Centaurus A uh, is an active uh, starburst galaxy that is also within uh, Centaurus, and it is um, the constellation of Centaurus, and it is an a, a very, Sen A, it's called the, the actual galaxy, in your list is NGC 5128. We call it Sen A at Chandra because it's been observed so many times by Chandra. It's a very active starburst galaxy, it is thought to be the result of two normal galaxies that collided together, and, and this is what's, what's left behind at this particular moment. It hasn't settled down. That, that collision and merger of these two galaxies have produced uh, um, an incredibly accelerated rate of star formation. And here are some of the images of it. This one's a Hubble image. Uh, again, another Hubble image. The disk, uh, gas and dust get disk of one galaxy is now orbiting around this, the, the, in, in a different orientation from the other galaxy. So it looks kind of a little weird there and is producing incredible jets of, of material from the massive black hole that, that is at the center. And those jets are blowing huge cavities and bubbles through space that are accelerating the rate of star formation and even more. Uh, Coma Berenices is a constellation I don't think you, we've ever had before in the event, maybe a long time ago. Bernice's hair. It is the only constellation that is named after an actual person, a historical person. Queen Be uh, Berenices was the uh, wife of Ptolemy III, the king of Egypt, so she was an Egyptian queen back in the 220 to 2. 60 BC era. So it's a very small constellation. It's pretty faint. You can't see an awful lot there. But within that constellation is a most interesting galaxy, um, NGC 4555. And it is a very, it's isolated. Now galaxies mostly are in large associations, groups, clusters, superclusters, they're gravitationally bound with other galaxies, but this one is all by its lonesome, all by itself, and it is surrounded by a 10 million degree uh, halo of gas all around the galaxy that was imaged by the Chandra mission. And in order to have that much hot gas staying associated with the galaxy, it should just fly away. It shouldn't be able to stay there. It should be flowing into the interstellar region ar around it, an intergalactic region around it even, uh, but it doesn't. So it is thought that there must be a huge, huge, huge mass of um, the dark matter that's whole associated with this galaxy that's holding all of that hot gas to it. Another uh, pair of galaxies in the same uh, Bernice's hair constellation, 4676, is called the Mice. And this one shows really well. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful image from Hubble. Um, you can see the streams of new stars have been formed. When these galaxies collide, they compress the gas. The gas uh, ends up uh, clumping together ends up becoming protostars, become stars, and it, it, it really greatly accelerates uh, the compression of the gas and therefore the formation of new stars. And you can see the tails of new stars, massive stars that have been formed 
uh, by the collision between these two galaxies. Uh, Corvus the Crow is a constellation we don't normally see. Um, actually, I like crows. Um, Corvus the Crow was a favorite of Apollo. And Apollo sent him one day uh, with his favorite goblet, golden goblet, to go get him some water. So Corvus the Crow. And at that time, the crow was a white silvery bird with a really melodious, beautiful voice. So Corvus sets off to get the water in Apollo's favorite golden goblet. And he sees a fig tree and he stops to eat a fig. They're not ripe enough to suit him, so he sits here and waits for the figs to ripen. Then he went and got the water, and when he took it back to Apollo, he made up a story that there was this water snake at the water place, so he had to fight off that snake in order to get the water for Apollo. Well, Apollo, he's a god of many things, sometimes the sun, music, melody, but he's also, you know, guards the truth. And he knew he was lying, so he punished Corvus the Crow by placing him in the sky. He turned him black, took away his melodious voice, gave him that croaky caw that crows have anymore, and put him on top of the water snake, which is a really mean, many-headed snake, to remind him uh, of his lie and put the goblet right in front of him next to the snake so he could remember the gods were never want to cross a god. They're mean. Now, Corvus the Crow has nothing too important in it except for the Antani, two more galaxies that are colliding, doing the gravitational dance, increasing the rate of stellar evolution. This, this collision has been going on now for over a hundred million years, and it will last, again, astronomically speaking, for a really long time. Here is a close-up of the Antani galaxy. Um, a composite image, and you can see all of those bright pink regions, those are star formation regions, and the blue dots that are bright mass of stars that are forming. This is what Hubble sees. This is what Spitzer sees in the infrared. This is what Chandra sees in the X-ray. And this is a composite of all three of those. Remember, you need to look at these objects in more than one wave wavelength because every one of these bandwidths of radiation are being produced by a different process. So you have to see it at all wavelengths to understand what's going on with the object. So Crux is, a, is actually the smallest constellation of all, uh, and it would be lost, and it, it's within the disk of the galaxy, so it's very, very, very uh, thick with gas and dust. There aren't any bright stars in it except for um, the Southern Cross. Four bright stars in Crux are the Southern Cross, um, and you can see how beautiful they stand out next to um, the background of stars. And another interesting object within the Southern Cross is the Dragonfish Nebula, and you can see that the, those two bright stars are two uh, new, star, new stars that are forming, radiating, heating up the dust around them, which are then radiating in, in red because the universe, that's hydrogen radiating in red in these ionized regions. Um, and it's, it, it looks like, actually looks like a dragonfish. Those two stars look like eyes. And then it has that sort of dark void, which is its mouth hanging open. Uh, that's actually a hundred light year long bubble of that, of, that is a void because the stars have photo evaporated the gas and dust as they are forming, carving out the, the nebula as they grow. So next is the Northern Cross, which is Cygnus. The swan is, is part of the Northern Cross, Cygnus and Deneb. Uh, Deneb is the bright star in Cygnus. And it is called, it is Cygnus the Swan, but it's also called the Northern Cross. And Deneb is also another one of those stars in part of the summer triangle, the asterism. And as you can see, uh, Deneb is an A21 star. So it has a luminosity class of one. It's very highly evolved, but it is an A, so it hasn't cooled enough to be over to the supergiant branch. It is still quite hot. 
but it is also very, and also very luminous. So Cygnus, the Northern Cross, and Deneb, it shows them here as in their configuration again with the Summer Triangle. And Doratus is a, the constellation that contains the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, Doratus and the Large Magellanic Cloud are in the Southern Hemisphere. And in the um, Large Magellanic Cloud is mostly in Doratus. It hangs over a little into Mensa, uh, the next nearby constellation. And this is a view of the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud as seen in the Southern Hemisphere from uh, the telescopes in Chile. And they are all part of the local group of galaxies. The large and small Magellanic Clouds, as well as Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxy, along with somewhere around 50 other galaxies, are the local group of galaxies. And it was always thought that lar the large Magellanic Cloud was just another irregular galaxy, but now there is some thinking that it might be a had might have been a, dis a sparred viral spiral galaxy and got disrupted by a an encounter with a, with a nearby galaxy. Within Doratus, as well as the large Magellanic Cloud, is the Tarantula Nebula, and it is one of the most complex star formation regions in the galactic neighborhood. It's really beautiful. Uh, you can see all of the, the blue, the, the, the reflection areas from massive stars being formed. Um, my problem with it is um, it's called the Tarantula Nebula. I, I'm, I don't see a tarantula there. Okay, sometimes these things look like what they're called usually. Sometimes you wonder. Now, everybody knows I love tarantulas, right? Because I'm always wearing my favorite hat that has a tarantula on it of the Mexican red mead variety. So, that doesn't look like a tarantula. So, I forgive whoever called that a tarantula to begin. Tried to find out where that name came from. I'm not, couldn't quite find that out. Uh, next, we have Gemini, which has Castor and Pollux, the, the twins within Gemini. And Castor itself is actually three sets of binary stars, so it's a six-star system. Uh, Pollux is already a red giant, so that has started evolving uh, red giants. And the sun will be a red giant also. If you go through the red giant stage, you will end up as, eventually as a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. And Pollux is well, is well on its way towards that final end product. Vega is the, well, it's the brightest star in the northern hemisphere summer sky and the fifth brightest star overall. But you will see that it's an AOV. It's a main sequence star. So how can it be that luminous and be a main sequence star? Well, for one thing, uh, it is only 25 light years away. So it's very, very close, which makes it look brighter. Most of the bright stars in the sky are much further away. So they look like they're dimmer, even though they're really brighter. And it also is one of those heavily rotating uh, stars that ha has been squished into an ellipsoidal sort of shape. Uh, it rotates um, every 12.5 hours. Uh, com that's compared to the sun, which rotates every 24 to 30 days. Vega, which is much, much larger, rotates once every 12.5 hours. It's moving. Then we have Orphe Orpheucus, the serpent holder. And um, Orpheucus is a zodiacal constellation. It does... The apparent path of the sun does go through this constellation. That means there are 13 zodiacal constellations, not 12. But since there's only 12 months, astrologers couldn't very well add Orpheucus in, so they left it out to make it 12 months so they could tell you what your star prophecy is. And, and the other thing about that is, you know, 13 is an unlucky number, too, so we don't want 13. However, 
There are 13. And at this present day, if you are born between November 30th and December the 18th, I believe, you are an Orpheucan, a serpent holder. And not only um, in within this constellation, right here in the middle, is the star um, Zeta Orpheuci. Zeta Orpheuci is a 9.09.5V uh, classification star. It's a main sequence star, but it is 09.5. It's almost a B, but it's still an, an O, and there are only half a dozen or so O-type stars that we can detect from here. Very, very rare, those really, really huge, huge, massive stars at the top of the main sequence. This is what, uh, this is a, an image of Zeta Orpheuci. What's interesting about it is it most probably had in its, in its past been in a binary system with a younger star, which went through its evolutionary sequences faster than Zeta Orpheuci and went through, became a, um, went through a supernova event and that event, the supernova event, ejected uh, Zeta Orpheuci out of its orbit around it and started it on this journey through the interstellar medium. You can see the bow, the bow curve that's been, that's from uh, the star plowing up the, the interstellar medium in front of it. It's moving along at about 24 kilometers per second. Uh, the Rho Orpheuci cloud complex is one of the closest and probably the most beautiful star formation regions that there is. Um, it has all the classic ingredients for them, uh, for star formation. You see the beautiful, beautiful blue areas that are reflection nebula, reflecting the ultraviolet radiation from the massive stars that are forming. You see the red colored regions, those are the emission nebula, where the um, dust grains are being heated up by the radiation from newly forming stars and emitting in the in the red part of the spectrum. And you see the, the dark absorption nebulas that are really concentrated gas and dust, which all the stars are forming out of. That's what collapses and forms the stars from those the dark uh, the dark nebula. So the central region of this is very prolific. It's there are at least 300 really massive stars in the center of this, all less than 300,000 years old. So they are really, really young. Uh, this is a, a close-up of the same region. And uh, when we get to Scorpius, uh, right here, this on, on in the bottom towards the right, that orangey blob, that's actually Antares, the star in the Scorpio. So the Scorpion as a constellation is right next to Orpheucus as a constellation. So the, the star formation complex encompasses more than just the Orpheucus constellation. And there it is again with um, Antares and right there in the, in it, uh, you can you can see um, to the bottom right now because this is the larger field of view that cluster there is actually a globular cluster M4. Uh, then of course we have Orion. If anybody knows any constellation, they usually know Orion, which has uh, Betelgeuse, the super red giant, in one of its shoulders and Rigel, a very bright star that's one of its legs. And um, Betelgeuse itself is an M to 1 classification, so it's highly, highly luminous, highly, highly evolved, and any astronomical day it could collapse into a supernova. Um, that's why it is that bright. Rigel itself is also very, very luminous. It is the same luminosity classification. Uh, however, it is a B star, very, very large, very bright, uh, still on the main sequence. 
So in the middle of the belt hanging down from Orion, we have M42, which is a, a star formation region. Um, the M42 is only about 1,500 light years away. So uh, it is observed a lot. 